to welcome you all to the end to uh, the annual pre-Pesach lecture in memory of Aaron Bowman, Olav Shalom, former president of our congregation, Osek Betzachet Sibor, poet, teacher, and friend, who was nifter on the first day of Pesach almost 13 years ago. It's strange, especially for those who are of us who are fortunate in having known Aaron, to think that Pinny and Melissa's daughter, Ariella, born towards the end of that year of Avedis, a name for her grandfather, is now a bat mitzvah. Strange, or perhaps not so strange. I am confident that Aaron would have considered such continuity the most natural thing in the world, although for all its naturalness, a source of great joy and affirmation. And in a sense, that is what brings us here tonight, to celebrate and rejoice in Aaron's legacy, to enjoy his presence and what he left behind. Of course, this, enjoy, this includes his beloved wife, Shelley, their kids, kids-in-law, and grandkids, and his mother, Mrs. Rivka Bowman, but also such products of his creativity as the poetry that was collected after his passing in A Man in a Room with a Talis on, and the unlikely fact that we still exist as a kahila. For the Washington Heights congregation, as we know it now, <coughs> welcoming, tolerant, committed to avoda and learning, but also open-minded, and perhaps just a little bit different from your boilerplate orthodox shul, this kahila still bears the stamp of Aaron's personality. Perhaps the most significant aspect of Aaron's Yerusha, however, is the least tangible, the influence he exerted as a teacher. Although he had not taught professionally for many years, he sought out every opportunity to share what he himself had learned, especially in the Mude Kodesh, with the widest range of students in the most diverse circumstances. My own, my own children, only four years old at Tispatira, learned the olive base from him, and they were among many young children who benefited in this respect. In the workplace, he introduced colleagues, people who had only tenuous links to Yiddishkeit, to the study of Shas. And on a higher level, he was actively involved in teaching and learning with some of this neighborhood's most distinguished scholars. It is thus entirely appropriate that we memorialize Aaron through this series of lectures, that is, through learning. And tonight's speaker, Rabbi Neil Fleischman, is especially well suited to this occasion. For not only is Rabbi Fleischman, in addition to being a poet and stand-up comic extraordinaire, a distinguished teacher of Gemara at Frisch High School, uh, he, all, he was also one of Aaron's closest friends, a kind of honorary member of the Bowman family, and indeed a long-standing Ben Bias of the Bridge School. How fortunate we are to be able to learn from him tonight. Um, okay, um, I had a lot of things in mind and I kind of sifted through them. One of my ideas was to share some poems. What I decided I'll do is after, if anyone's interested, um, I'll give my email. You can email me and I'll email you back the poems. I printed out a piece of paper with the link to three poems I wrote about Aaron, but I forgot to bring it. Also. A lot of the ideas I'm saying I've written up and are online, and I'll give you the link for that also. If you email me, I could just tell you where to find it. Okay. Um, on Shabbos, I was visiting my father in assisted living, and I overheard someone talking, and I wasn't sure if they made a mistake or not. They said how they remembered when they were growing up, their mother would always start preparing for Pesach and Hanukkah. I think they probably meant Purim. I've confused no, it to no, myself. No. <laughs> no, really? Wow. Okay. Okay. 
So with that in mind, I was thinking that I should really go back and talk about cleaning for Pesach and Bira Hametz, but it's really endless. So I'm going to start with the Seder, and I'm going to start with the word Seder. Um, why is a Seder called a Seder? Um, so in my Anashal Torah, it quotes the Maharal, and for a long time I liked the saying of the Maharal, but I, it took me a long time to make real sense of it. It's one of those things that sounded deep, but I didn't really know what it meant for a long time. Still not sure if I do. He says that it's to remind us that even miracles have order to them. You look at a miracle and it could seem haphazard, and it's to remind us that even miracles have order. My way of sort of maybe reinterpreting that is to remind us that miracles are not detached from our daily life. In the same way that we have a problem sometimes, we look at holy people and we say they're holy, but you know, we're not like that. Or we, we look at holy books and we say that's a holy book, but you know, it's not for me. So too, we look at miracles and miracles are to remind us that every second of the tapestry of our lives is a miracle. The Ramban says at the end of Bo, talking about Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, that the point of big miracles like Yitzhiya Mitzrayim is to remind us that every second of our lives is a miracle and to remind us of the quote-unquote small miracles of life. It's been said the only difference between nature and miracle is how often something happens. If something didn't happen often and we saw it, just a plant growing, we would think it would be miraculous. So that's one idea of why it's called a Seder. I thought on my own of another idea why it's called a Seder, because tonight, well, not tonight, but I'm pretending. I'm in, I'm in the zone of Pesach night. Um, on the Seder nights, um, we celebrate freedom, and a lot of times people misunderstand freedom. So I think the word Seder might be used specifically to remind us that you need a Seder, you need an order, in order to have freedom. A great, uh, I think Aaron might have liked this reference, a great jazz musician once said, Winton Marsalis. For a long time I mistakenly called him Winston. It's like, I hate when people do that to me. I have a unique Hebrew name and people correct my name for me. Like, <laughs> I know my name, I, he knows his name. It's, it's Winton, not Winston. Winton Marsalis said, there's no freedom in freedom, there's only freedom in structure. And he was talking about jazz music <coughs> and how people have this, this misconstrued notion that a jazz musician gets up and just plays whatever he wants. It's true about poetry also. The only way that you can, in an artful way, free associate is when you know the rules really well. There's no freedom in freedom, there's only freedom in structure. So I think it's not an accident that our celebration of freedom is called a Seder because it's reminding us that the most important thing for our freedom is having a seder, having an order. There's the idea that there's two types of freedom, freedom from and freedom for. It's the same idea of why Pesach connects with Shavuot, because Pesach we were free from Mitzrayim, but we were only really free when we connected it with Shavuot, and we were free for being what we're meant to be. That's why the Ramban says it's really one long holiday, with Pesach being the first day, Shavuot being the last days, and the Omer, which we today associate, unfortunately, with, with sadness, is really Cholamoed, is really a celebratory time building up to receiving the Torah. Um, a little boy was once asked, a Russian boy, why he decided to become religious and what was his favorite thing about being religious. They were taking him into yeshiva and someone needed to interview him. And he said his favorite thing was not being able to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And again, that's the idea, I think, the beginning of um, celebrating this night and understanding this night is that we need Seder, we need structure. Nobody really wants, you know, no format and no structure. Um, I think it's important to note that the Haggadah is a book. Um, based on my research, which today means pushing Google, um, based on my research, and, and people never guess this. When you ask someone, like a trivia question, what Jewish book are there the most versions of, the answer is the Haggadah. There are more published Haggadahs than there are Chumash, Tanakh, anything else. Second place, if you want to play for fun at your Seder, second place is Pirkei Avot. The most, uh, these are like the two most fun books for Jews, that there's constantly more and more coming out, even more than other ones that you would think might rank higher. Yes? More than story? 
Um, according to my, my Google research, yeah, yeah. It could be the sitter is maybe considered a, a, a prayer book as opposed to like a, you know, a safer book. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Number, different yeah. versions rather than numbers in print. Right, that's what, that's what I think. I, I, I can read. I think I, I think I wrote it down here. Karen G. R. Rokard wrote an essay called The Evolution of the Passover Haggadah. And she wrote, if a measure of Jewish affection for a book were to rest with the number of versions. Versions. Yes. Okay, so there's lots of yes. stuff going on in the world. Yeah. There's a lot of versions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and she gives numbers. In the 16th century, there were 25 uh, 37 in the 17th century, 230 in the 18th century, 19th century there were 1,250, and in the 20th century it, it passed 3,000. Um, okay. Um, and I think it's important to remember that the Haggadah is a book. We live in a time where books are fast disappearing. A Rebbe of mine in Israel, Rav Nachman Kahana, once said that one of the signs of a Jewish home is having books, like you have a different view. Oh, you have a similar view. You're looking at books. I'm looking at books. When you walk in a Jewish home, you see um, books. It's a, it's some say, many say, it's the way we fill the mitzvah, writing a Sefer Torah. Um, there's a sad story I read that a, a mother was walking with her child, and they passed by a library, and she said, maybe we'll go there one day, a little three-year-old. And, um, and he didn't understand what a library was. The only way that she could explain it, that, you know, she said, you borrow books. He said, you buy books? No, borrow books. Buy books? Borrow books. Finally, she explained it's kind of like the way you, you borrow DVDs or video games. He's like, oh, that sounds nice. Let's go there sometime. Um, <laughs> but he didn't get the idea of uh, borrowing a book. It wasn't uh, on his radar. Um, so also, when we start the Seder, we're, we're getting closer, in case you're wondering if we're going to get into the words. We're getting closer. The first words that we say in the Haggadah are a song, and there there are many sources as to when the song goes back to and the tune. And I think it's important that we start off again, reminding ourselves that there is a seder. It's not an accident that there are 15 um, stages of the seder. It's the 15. It parallels the steps of the Beit Hamikdash. It parallels the 15 Shir Hamalot. 15 is a number that comes up many times, and it's our way of going through a process in the night where we're ascending spiritually in levels. You know, we say that we're supposed to see ourselves as if we went out from Mitzrayim, and Mitzrayim also means Mitzrayim, our own structures. We're freeing ourselves, and it's a process that we go through step by step. It's 15 steps. Interestingly, um, when we sing Dayenu, Dayenu is also 15 steps. And we're recreating those same. There's a parallel between these 15 and those 15. Just as a side point, 15 comes up a lot in our liturgy. In Yishtabach, there are two uh, references to 15, also of the building up. There are 15 words of uh, praise in Yishtabach. And, um, and at the end, in the bracha, there are 15 words after Baruch HaTashem. If you do it in your head and it doesn't make sense, I'll explain it later. It does, but that's just in parentheses. Um, one of my favorite Haggadahs, like many people every year I try to buy a new one, someone I was blessed to teach with who also lived and taught and was around in this neighborhood, uh, Rav Shlomo Khan. So he wrote one of the very first English and Hebrew Haggadahs. He did something brilliant that I don't think anyone else has done. There's two halves to it. He does the whole thing twice so you have a different Haggadah for each night. Um, now you're all going to want to go buy it, but I think it's out of print. <laughs> but it's really, it's amazing. Um, go on the computer and see if it's, it might be available. Um, so he says some really nice things. Um, he says that one of the reasons we start, um, okay, well, I'll, I'll get back to him in a minute. We start with Kadesh. So Kadesh is the normal Kiddush of the year. Kadesh is a Jewish concept of taking something and making it holy. It's also pointed out that Kadesh comes before Rechatz. You would think that Rechatz would come first. Rechatz is a way of purifying ourselves, washing ourselves, and then we become holy. So Rabbi Abraham Tursky and others point out that Kadesh, we're being told on the Seder night, besides being a very popular book, 
the Seder is probably the most popular, one of the most popular Jewish um, celebrations of the year where all kinds of people get together. And we're being reminded that inside every Jew is holy. Before we have to prepare, people might be very, it happens all the time at the Seder, people are extremely self-conscious and people are told, you have your pencil of yid, you have your kadesh, your kadosh, your holiness inside. On a similar but different note, Rav Cook says that kadesh is a command. We're all commanded, whatever holiness we start with, to make ourselves holy. And that's again one of the themes of the night, is moving up in holiness. Um, The Kiddush on this night is different than other nights because it's the first of the four cups. So we'll just talk for a minute about the four cups. Many of us are taught that there are... are um, there's different ways of phrasing it. And I think the most precise way of phrasing it is Arba Lishone Geula, or Arba Lishone of Geula. Um, Wait, let me say that again. I was imprecise. That's the way that we're taught it, but it's actually Arba Geula. The Rashbam makes a big deal about this, and he's quoted by the Torah Tamima, who says that it's not just four phrases or four synonyms. Like anyone that's ever written an essay for school knows, you use the same word once, twice, three times, you just shift it around. But here, they're actually different, not just different words, but he says it's different stages. And there's a lot of different ways of breaking it up. First, the work got easier, then the work stopped, then they were taken out, and then they or we were made the nation of Hashem. And the Torah to me makes a very big deal about this, that it's Arba Geula and not Arba, Arba Lashone Geula. Sorry, I mixed it up. That's what it is, that it's four different Geulas. And it's something else that I didn't understand for a while I was thinking about. And I think the explanation might be that in life, we often, we want our redemptions to come suddenly. And redemptions come in stages, and we need to celebrate and experience each stage and be grateful for it. So it's important that it's Arba Geula that we recognize and appreciate each stage, and also it's a lesson for us in life that our redemptions come in stages. I once said this, and someone asked me, there's a saying, Geula Hashem Keherath Ayin, that God's redemption comes in the blink of an eye. I think it's like, on, on a very different note, whenever, whenever someone passes from this world, we feel like it's sudden, even though there have been stages of it happening, at the last second it always feels sudden. Similarly with redemption, when it happens, it feels like it happened in the blink of an eye. But when we look back, we can also see that there were stages. Um, <coughs> Washing our hands is something that we do all the time. We're up to Rechatz now, we're fine. Rechatz is something we do all the time. But just a thought about why we wash our hands, that I think is a, maybe a drop out of the box. We, we think of our head as the top of us, but really, if we would stretch our bodies, our fingertips and our hands are the beginning of our body. The Maharal and others point this out and say we wash our hands to sanctify and recognize the beginning of all things, the beginning of our physical existence, our life is, is holy, and that's one idea why we wash hands. The rabbis have very harsh words for someone that doesn't wash their hands before eating bread, and perhaps it's an idea of respecting ourselves and the way we begin our existence in, in life. This is also, many point out, is, is phrased as a command, rechatz, we have to, as opposed to later on, where it's not the same, uh, it, it's, it's someone in this watching this phrase as a command, as opposed to later, where it's more passive. Because since this one is so unusual, we don't usually do it, we have to be commanded and reminded that we have to, that we have to do it. Okay, so we're up to now the karpas. We say a on the karpas, and we have in mind um, that it covers the mara. And then comes the yachat, and this is one of my um, favorite ideas. But first, one more thing on karpas. Um, this is what I was going to say before from Rabbi Khan, points out that the karpas teaches us a lesson. A, a vegetable, it's a seed thrown in the ground, grows in the ground, 
and here it is on the Seder <coughs> table. And when we see it on the Seder table, it should remind us again of our potential in life to become holy. The, um, the fact that the Karpas is here reminds us just of the potential that we have in life. Here's something that you wouldn't think would ever be here, and it's here as part of our holy um, setting. Um, also, just as a side point, uh, Rabbi Pinkos Tights always used a banana. Some people might have heard this for Karpas, just to teach people the halakha that a banana, you say, and a dama on it, and just to add to the theme of the night of people asking questions. So then we, we break the matzah. When we break the matzah, we break it in half, but everybody knows there's no such thing as half unless you could somehow do something perfectly. But when we break it, I've never seen people breaking it exactly really in half. So then there's the bigger and the smaller. Which one do you put aside? So we know we put aside the bigger one. Why do we put aside the bigger one? So the idea is that the bigger geula is yet to come. And this could be a whole talk in and of itself, that a time is going to come when we don't talk about Yitzhak Mitzrayim anymore, or if we do talk about it, it's overshadowed by how great the, the geula that we're still yet to experience is going to be. So we put aside the bigger piece, the Meshach Hachma says it, to indicate that the bigger part of Geula is still to come. Um, one beautiful explanation I heard of this, just like in addition to it, is not only is the bigger part still to come, but we all know we have the custom, the bigger piece gets hidden away, and then it's brought back to us. According to most customs, how do we get that big piece that represents the bigger Geula to come, how do we get that back? Who brings it to us? Children. Because the ge'ula, the bigger ge'ula still to come, is through the, the purity, through the learning, through the Torah of children. The Gemara says that Mashiach is going to come through the, the, the hevel, through the breath and the learning and the lives of pure children. So I think that's a nice idea. Um, okay, let's come on. We'll say that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, let me just think. Let's go. Um, I just want to add one story that I was thinking to say as an introductory story, and I'm just going to say it now. We've mentioned a couple of times that we're building up tonight towards a process of holiness and redemption. So there's a story that I heard of two homeless men, and one was Jewish and one wasn't, and the one that was Jewish told the other one, there's a night coming up, trust me, if you go to a Jewish house, so they're going to have this amazing meal. Just get yourself invited, put on one of these, you know, make yourself look like this, and you'll get invited. So he gets invited and he goes, and he's all excited for this meal, and he could smell good food, but there's this meal, and they start talking, and they start late, and they start singing, and then they drink a little wine, everybody has a cup of wine, he's like, okay, off to a good start, and everyone eats like a little piece of parsley, and it's dipped in salt water, and he's getting a little frustrated, and time goes on, and, and um, it's taking a long time, um, and there isn't really food, and he's getting really hungry, and then finally... They say, okay, now, you know, we're going to eat something. And they eat this cardboard. And he's very upset and very frustrated. And they say, we're going to make a sandwich. And they first they eat some bitter stuff by itself. And they make a bitter stuff sandwich with the cardboard. He said, I've had enough of this. And he runs out. He goes to his friend and says, you misled me. It was terrible. And his friend says, what are you talking about? He said, there was no meal. He said, when do you leave? He said, I left after the cardboard bitter sandwich. He said, oh, it's so sad. You left right before the great meal was going to come. So some use that as an analogy, the way that the Seder itself sometimes can feel long. So to our process of waiting for the redemption can feel long. But if we could just hold out, wait a little longer, we're getting closer and closer and closer. The, um, the, um, the Malbim was once asked why he predicted when he felt Mashiach would come. And he said, after all, Yaakov Avinu wasn't allowed to predict it. Why do you and other rabbis predict it? And he said, that's simple. And I find this amazing that this goes so far back. He said, you know how when you're going on a trip, 
you, you pull out of the driveway. He didn't say pull out of the driveway, whatever. You pull out of the barn. And the kids ask right away, are we almost there yet? Are we almost there yet? And you quiet them down and say, you know, please give me a break. Then, as you're getting closer, they can feel that you're almost there. And they say, are we almost there yet? And you say, half hour more, 20 minutes more. And you might even debate, 20 minutes, half hour. But everyone agrees it's coming soon. So you say, that's why we could taste it. We're almost there. It's like when you get close to the meal, we're all excited. It's almost there. We know also we're close to the redemption, to the Gaula that's coming. So after, after we do the karpas, we point to the matzah and we say halachmanya. And there's an analogy. I like stories and analogies. There's an analogy that Magadav did know. He asked the question, and I'm sure there are myriad answers. This is one answer. Why do we point to the matzah and say halachmanya? This is the bread of affliction or the bread of poverty. We should say ki halachmanya or ha this is a reminder of the bread of affliction. So he gives an example. He says there was someone who was very poor. He used to walk around. He had a sack over his shoulder. He would collect scraps. He would just get by however he could. He managed somehow to support his family. One day, one day he turns over a garbage pail. He finds um, a diamond. He becomes rich. And everything for the family changes. And he buys him presents, he buys him nice clothing, and they're very excited. A year goes by, and he comes home again dressed in tatters. And the children get scared, they start to cry, the wife is worried. And he explains to them, no, look, outside I have presents, I have clothing, I have good food. I'm just dressed this way because it's the anniversary. Every year on the anniversary, I'm going to remember the way that we used to be. And they got used to it year after year, until one year, the year seemed to go by way too quickly. And it did. He came home dressed differently, looking worn, and his family asked him, and he said, it's not just a reminder this time. We really are back to the old ways. I've been trying to hold it together, but we've been slipping, and things are back to the way they were. So similarly, we say halach manya, because as much as we feel comfortable and we feel that we're close to the redemption, like we said before, we are still in Galut, wherever in the world we live, we're in a time period of Galut, we're not where we really want to be, and we point to the matzah and we say, halach manya, this is our bread of affliction. That's why also when we go through the 15 stages and we go through the um, dayenu, we don't end with the story that we're, we think we're dealing with tonight, we end with the story of getting the Beit HaMikdash, and we're really looking even beyond that to the Beit HaMikdash that we're still hoping for it. So it's halach manya, it's, it's the bread of our own um, affliction. Then we say manishtana, and there's an interesting halacha that if you're alone, what do you do? Right? We all know that when you're together with people, the youngest person or the children generally ask you, what does someone do if they're alone? So the Gemara and the halacha say, a person asks the question to themselves. So I think it's important in life, it's a lesson that we need to ask and answer questions for ourselves. Sometimes we put up like a straw man. The children, oh, the children need the questions answered. It's like the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot that says, Dama Shetashiv Lapi I remember many years ago, Rav Noach Weinberg came to YU to speak, and he said, I'm known for speaking to Bali Tshuva, I'm known for reaching out to people, but I'm speaking here, and if you think that my speech doesn't apply to you, just know we all have and not because inside ourselves. We all have to ask and answer questions for ourselves. And I think that applies also. These questions can be boiled down to basic questions about Judaism and who we are, and we need to ask and answer these questions for ourselves. So that's why even when someone's alone, they ask and answer these, these questions. Then we say, Abadim Hayinu, and we talk about how Ilu Lahotzi HaKadosh Baruch Hu at Avatendim in Mitzrayim, if we weren't taken out, we say that all of us would still be Meshubadim Lepara Ben Mitzrayim. We would still be enslaved to Parah. So that seems rather unlikely that we would still be slaves to Parah in Mitzrayim. Eventually, you know, we know that Parah disappeared, Egypt as it was disappeared, the world changed. We probably wouldn't still be there as slaves. So the answer, I think, is it's not talking physically, it's talking that we were 
slaves to Paro, we were enslaved in a spiritual sense. If Hashem didn't take us out, um, if Hashem didn't take us out, then we would all still be subjugated to Paro, back to what we said before, the freedom from and the freedom for. Eventually, we would have gotten freedom from Paro, most probably, but the freedom for, we really needed the gift of Torah from Hashem. And perhaps that's how it flows into the next part. Even if we're all Chachamim and Nevonim, everyone, we have to talk about Yitzhia Mitzrayim, and we have to recognize that what makes us free is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us out. Eventually we would have gotten out, but the real story is the, is the between the line story and the point of why we were taken out, which was, which was the Torah. Um, okay. Many point out that when we say Baruch HaMakom, it's a short version of Birchat Torah before we start quoting different verses of the Torah. The Manishtana was four questions, and now we get to the four sons. Four is another big number on the Seder night. The best explanation that I've heard that I like about the number four is that um, we say, uh, they used to bring a carbon Toda, or today we say, Dear Chana Gomel, we're grateful to God for four miraculous salvations that they happen to us in life. If we're saved from a desert, if we're saved from a sea, if we're saved from being incarcerated, or if we're saved from an illness. All four of those things happen together. I believe it's the Vilna Gaon who points this out. And that's really the root of all the fours that come up. The four questions, the four sons, the four cups, uh, the four hours it takes, etc. Um, if, if you're quick. Um, something that I noticed only a couple of years ago, and it was pointed out, um, by um, by Rabbi Kohn in the um, it's called the historical Haggadah. It points out it's, it's one of those things when you hear it you feel like you knew it forever, but honestly I <coughs> didn't know it until he pointed it out. It says Keneged um, Arba Banim Dibra Torah. The Torah spoke about four sons: Echad Chacham, the Echad Rasha, the Echad Tam, the Echad Shemer Yedei L'Shol. You you should never say unless you really know the Torah code, like something never appears anywhere else. It might, but to the best of my limited knowledge, when it says Arba Avod Nezikin, when it says there are four categories of damage, it just says there's four, and then it says what they are. The way that we count is one, two, three, four. I'm not great at math, but I know that's how we count. Whenever we're told there's a number or something, it says there's a number, and then it says what they are. This is a very unusual way of counting. It says echad, 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 echad. It's very unusual, right? So I think the answer is, the answer that he gives, which I really like, is that it's stressing this is a night of education. This is a night of connecting with children. So you have to remember that each one, you might prefer one, you might connect better with one, but each one is one. Each one is whole. Each one counts. There's not one and another and another and another and, oh yeah, one more. Um, it's one and one and one and one. The rasha is one. The tam <coughs> is one. Each one counts in and of themselves. And this is, again, a topic we could give just one long talk just on this topic, but I think it goes back to the idea of Hanoch Lenar al Pidarko that we're told to educate children according to their way. And Rabbi Samson Fahl Hirsch says a very controversial idea, and it's based on Rashi, and it's based on Chazal. He says that, it says when, when Yitzchak and Esau turned 13, they went their separate ways. But he said the reason why they went their separate ways when they were 13 and not before is because till they were 13, and I'm modernizing it a little, their parents gave them the same haircuts and dressed them in the same sailor suits and sent them to the same Masmidim program in the same camp and the same school and the same <laughs> class and put them with the same friends and tried to make them exactly the same. And it was the, it was the right program for Yaakov, it was the wrong program for Esau. And Rabbi Hirsch says, world history would be different, our history would be different if they had more catered to Esau, let him 
you know, join the Israeli army, let him uh, be on the wrestling team, let him do the things that, that he needed to do, and not just say, no, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're of the wrong type. It sounds a little harsh, so I'm happy he said it. I didn't make it up. Um, I once heard pointed out that we say, Chanoch Lenar al I heard Rabbi Pesach Kron point out that the word Chanoch is written without the Vav. So he says, based on that, that it's easy to educate a child that's whole. But the truth is, no child is whole, no child is perfect. And we have to remember to educate someone, again, everyone is echad, 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 in their own way, everybody is whole, but no one's going to be perfect, we have to educate everyone. But I have my own take on it. I think if he was right, it wouldn't be chanoch that would be missing the letter, it would be nar that would be missing the letter. I think the fact that chanoch is missing the letter is telling us that our education, we're the ones missing something. The, the kids are perfect. It's echad, 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 echad. But it's the chanoch that's damaged. It's our education that's missing something. And we have to try, even though we're probably never going to get it perfectly. But we're the ones that are flawed in our way of teaching. And that's why it stresses here, echad, 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 echad. They're fine. Okay. Um, there are a lot of takes on the four sons. Um, some say that it applies to four generations in America. It kind of morphed from the, the people that came were like the Chachamim, and then there was the rebellious Russia, and then there was the, um, the Tam, and then there was the Eniyadeh Lashol, who didn't know how to ask at all. Rabbi Riskin is the one that I've heard from who points out that today there's the fifth son who doesn't even come to the Seder. It used to be there were different later, different layers, different levels of personalities, but they were all there. Today there are people that are so disenfranchised, they don't come. And that goes back to what we said before. I think it's important we start with Kadesh. All Jews have holiness inside them, and it's a night of welcoming everyone. A a cute story, which is one of those things that could be provocative. I'm going to say it and move on. Um, it says, Mitkila of the Avodazara Hayu At the beginning, our forefathers worshipped Avodazara. So, someone who was very anti religious, who was very secular, once said to a very religious, um, pious Jew, Why are you being so old fashioned? Why can't you live in modern times? Why can't you let go? So, the guy. The religious person said back, me, you're the one being old-fashioned, because it says, Mikila of the Avodazara, Hayu Avatena. Before there was religion, before there was that new insight, that's, that's the new light in the world, is religion. The old way is to worship Avodazara and not to recognize God. So it, it, it could be a little more complicated than that, but I, I think it's a cute story. Um... We go back and we talk about Lavan. I think it's important to know why we go back and talk about Lavan. It's also interesting that when you, when you learn the Chumash itself, and it says Arami Oved Avi, there are many different explanations. When you look at the Chumash itself, many of the main commentaries say that the Arami being spoken of is Avraham, and it's understood in a totally different way. But the approach of the Haggadah adopts that we all know is that Arami Oved Avi means that an Armenian was trying to kill our father, that Lavan was trying to kill Yaakov. The reason why I think it's important to, to note this is that when we appreciate something, appreciation needs to be whole and complete. We go back to the very beginning. We don't just thank Hashem for Yitzhia Mitzrayim, but we thank Hashem going way back to what isn't even visible to the eye. It's like when, when uh, uh, an, an offspring wants to thank a parent, they want to know the story, how the parents first met. They want to appreciate and be grateful for everything to the very beginning. And that's why also this passage about Lavan is said when we get to Israel and we bring the first fruit, we don't just say thank you for the first fruit. Again, we go way back to the beginning. And I think it fits with the Hebrew phrase, hakarat hatov, is usually translated as thankfulness or appreciation. But really, hakarat hatov means recognizing the good, seeing the good. 
We always say we need to teach kids to say thank you. Maybe we really need to teach kids and adults to, to feel thank you. When we really feel thank you, it's a natural thing. When we get something from someone or even from something, like a, a favorite chair or favorite food, we feel gratefulness in return. We need to remind ourselves to feel grateful. And when we feel grateful, we go back to the very beginning. So that's the say ulamad. Maybe it means go out of our comfort zone. Don't just focus on the here and now and go back to the very beginning and go back to what's unseen to the eye. Also, we, we know that Esav is referred to as Edom, and Esav wanted to destroy the Jewish people, and his name reflects who he was. He was red like blood. It's possible that Lavan's name also reflects who he was. He doesn't seem like such a bad guy, and there's two types of enemies that the Jewish people, and also as individuals, we deal with in life. There are the people that we know are out to, to get blood, and there are the people that come dressed in white, and talk about, you know, they're our best friends, and we need to be careful because under the surface, they might be trying to destroy us. Um, let's see. I go till 10, right? Um, um, an interesting game to play at the Seder is people always say that Moshe's name doesn't appear in the Haggadah. It appears once. Every year I forget exactly where it is, and then some point during the Seder, I find it. Um, I heard something recently that we say that by Yaminu Bahashem of Moshe Abdo, the people came to believe in, Moshe, in Hashem and in Moshe. Um, there was something a little bit flawed in that, and I heard this actually at Purim time, that the reason why Purim was like a high level of reconnection with God is because it was just God. The people weren't saying anyone else. We always, we always say that we play Nan Moshe. We don't know where he's buried. We don't mention his name in the Haggadah because, um, because we want to recognize it's all from Hashem. But the truth is, at that time, it was by Amina Hashem over Moshe Abdo. Part of our religion is believing that Moshe was the greatest prophet ever. I remember I once heard a shir from Rabbi Menachem Liebtag, and he mentioned something about how it's still a struggle today to play down Moshe. And I said, but we, we do play him down, so it's not a problem. And he said, well, when you have to go out of your way to do so many things about something, it means that it's still a struggle. So I think we do struggle to recognize what we say, Lo Malach, not through anyone. Everything was done directly from directly from Hashem. Um, when we say the Dayenu, um, there's one that always stands out that I like to notice and talk about, which is um, we say it would have been enough to be taken to Har Sinai if we would have been brought to our Sinai and not given the Torah, it would have been enough. So how is that enough? We're at a mountain. We don't get the Torah. Why is that enough? So there are a lot of explanations. One is that it was very spiritual. If you walk through a perfume factory, you don't buy perfume maybe, but you still come out smelling like perfume. Since it was a spiritual place, it would have been enough just to be there. Another one, which I think is really important for us to remember, is that at Har Sinai we were Ke'ishachad Belevachad. It says by Yichan in singular, the Jewish people came together there. And we all know, unfortunately, it's unique for Jewish people to come together. So it would have been enough if we were brought there and we united as a people, <coughs> even if we didn't get the Torah. But perhaps the most out-of-the-box approach to this fits with the saying, Lo he. There's a famous story Right, that God doesn't want the Torah to just be in Shemaim, and He lets us decide. And there were, there were rabbis that were, were arguing about something, and one tried to prove that God was on His side. And in the end, Hashem came down, and His voice said, Lo Shemaim He. The majority rules, the rabbis get to decide. So perhaps that's what it means. If we were brought to our Sinai, which implies that we got the Torah, but the Lo Natan Lanu at a Torah. It wasn't put in our auspices. It wasn't put in our control. It was left in Shemayim. That would have been enough. That would have been 
fine. That still would have been a level. But the higher level is that God gave us the the control of the Torah. Um, we're in charge of passing it down and maintaining it. Um, Um, we speak about Pesach, Matzah, and Maror is the three main things. So Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. So Pesach um, is that a Kaddish Baruch who passed over. Um, and the idea is that on the Seder night, on the on the night of, on that night of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, so, HaKadosh Baruch did everything for us. The one thing that he needed us to do is say that we were on board. And he needed us to show that we believed in him. So that's also just something to remember in life. HaKadosh Baruch carries us. He does so much for us. But we just have to show that we believe, that we commit. Matzah. There's a lot to say about matzah. I'm fond of the approach. And I remember years ago, I met someone who was very cynical about Matzah was not an observant Jew. And when I said this idea, they liked the idea. They were very, like so many Jews, this person was very into Hinduism and Buddhism and said that it, it sounded like an eternal truth to them. They didn't know Judaism could be so deep. It's a problem. Um, that, that matzah represents getting rid of our egos. Um, Chametz is fluff. Chametz is phoniness. Chametz is blowing things, making you know something out of nothing. Matzah is realness, and we search and we burn and we work and we purify to be real. Pesach is a time of returning to our real self. So that's just a thought. Again, it could be a whole talk in and of itself, but that's a talk of um, that's one one thought about matzah and Mara. Um, I'm not going to add anything to my, it's uh, bitter enough on its own. Um, I once heard that, and perhaps many people said this, I heard this from the Rosh Hashiva of Karen Biyavna, that he said that of all the myriad things we do on the Seder night, the hardest mitzvah is the one that says, Behold, door of a door, Chayavadam Lirad Atzmok, Ilahu Yatsam in Mitzrayim. To really feel that we went out from Mitzrayim, to really reenact that, and feel it in our kishkas, that's the hardest mitzvah of the night. We get caught up sometimes, and we should be careful about measurements of the matzah and the mara and the kiddush and the timing. But most important is to really do this mitzvah of seeing ourselves as if we went out from Mitzrayim, and again, that we went out from our own mitzrayim, from our own narrow um, places. Um, I always feel bad for Hallel because Hallel is split by the meal. And when I was growing up, like many people, I thought that after the meal, everything was extra credit. Um, and the truth is that, that Hallel is in the middle. And many people say during the meal, we're only supposed to talk about things relating to Pesach and celebrate because the meal is, doesn't mean that the important part of the Seder is over. The meal is really... It's, it's like a sandwich. The meal is in the middle of the two halves of hollow, and it's part of the hollow. It's part of the celebration of the hollow is having the meal. And then when we're finished with the meal, we continue, but it's not at all a break. And again, many point out that before the meal and after the meal, we said before that the Seder really looks to the future. It doesn't just end with getting out from its triumph. Before the meal, we focus more on the past, and after the meal, we focus more on the, on the future. And the meal is the connection between the two, the celebration of the past and the bridging it to the future. Um, um, something that I'm not sure how it started, but there's a nice idea that uh, before we have the meal, a lot of people eat eggs, and there's just a, there's a lot of things said about eggs. My favorite thing about the egg is that 
the, the egg has two creations to it. First, the egg comes out of the chicken. That's one birth. And then the chick comes out of the egg. That's the second birth. So, too, it's like what we spoke about before, that we were taken out of Mitzrayim, and that was one level of freedom. But then we were given the Torah, and that's really the purpose. That's the next level of freedom. Um, there's also an idea... Um, about the egg, that it, it's an analogy, that we, we always talk about how we hit the 49th level of impurity, and God had to take us out quickly, because if we would have waited any longer, we would have been lost. So the question is, why didn't he take us out earlier? He's not like me and a lot of people I know that procrastinates and thrives on saving things for the last minute. That's not a godly trait. So why did God wait for the last minute? So the answer is that we need it the process of going down in order to go up. It's the same reason why Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. It's the same reason why Galut in general is part of Geula. And back to the chicken analogy, if you, if you would break an egg open before it's time, everything inside the egg is putrid and rotten. But at the exact right moment, things putrefy, and then at the exact right moment, things turn around. If you would break it too early, it wouldn't be right, and if you would do a really mean, like a mean little boy thing to do, this would be you put crazy glue, coat the whole egg with crazy glue, and the chick can't come out, and then it comes out too late, also it wouldn't work. It had to be at the right moment, but it was one whole process. And just like the egg and the chick has that process, we have the process, and Gaula and Gaulus go together. Um... I think a few more minutes. Um, Nishma, just a quick commercial for Nishma. I'm a big fan of Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky, and um, he's written at this point about 60 books, and I, I, he always says he's really written the one book, same one book, one time, over and over. And I don't like when he says that, because I'm a little bit of a, like, maven in his books. He might think they're all the same, but some are the same, but, but, but a lot of them are very different, and each has something the other doesn't have. Some things that he thinks are important, he does repeat in different books, and one of them is his love of Nishma. He once heard, uh, he worked for many years with alcoholics, and he once heard an alcoholic who was struggling, a recovered alcoholic, still thought of himself as recovering and never completely recovered, and once when he was struggling, he said, God didn't take me this far to abandon me now. And he thought it was a very beautiful thing to say. And then he said, oh my God, I say that every Shabbos in Nishmat. And I say that in Nishmat at the Seder, that, that God didn't take us this far to abandon us now. Of course, I'm not going to find the line now, but it's in there. That's an assignment for the Seder. Find where we say that in Nishmat, that, that God didn't take us so far to abandon us. And then we say Yishtabach. So now that I have in front of me, I'll, I'll illustrate what I said before. It's Shir Ushvacha Halal Bizimra Oz Nemshala Netzach Kidula Ukvara Tila Kitiferet Kidisha Umachud Brachot Fehodaot. That's 15 words of praise. And then we say, um, we say, Barakata Hashem, Kel Melakadol Batish Bachod, Kel Hahorod, Adon Haniflor, Abukher Bishire Simra, Mela Kel He, Haolamin. That's 15. Huh? Oh, thank you. Adhena Lo Azavuna Rachamacha. Thank you so much. Until this point, your mercies have not abandoned us, and the implication is it's not going to stop now, it's going to continue. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's a book by, um, by Adnon called Adhena. He, a lot of the Jewish writers picked up on phrases from Daven, both for their names and for things they wrote. So he has a work called Adhena. Um, okay. Um, we're winding down. Um, we say Lishana Bab Yerushalayim. We say that three times same two times that many people wear the kittel, which is um, Yom Kippur time, right at the end, and the Seder time, and there are connections. It, it has to do with the idea of what's really, when was the world created, one is when the world was created, one is when the Jewish people is created. They're both times of beginning, they're both times of potential, 
there again both times of um, taking the physical and making it holy. Yerushalayim is just really land and dirt and stones, but it's the idea of taking something physical and making it holy. So at the time of tshuva, at Yom Kippur time, at the time of our freedom and the beginning of, of being holy and receiving the Torah, we say Lashana Babi Yerushalayim, which is the idea of having a physical place that we make holy. And so too, that's the whole point of our life, taking our physical bodies, our physical beings, and making it and making it uh, holy. Um, I'll just end with one thought that's not about the Seder per se, but it's something that can be spoken about at the meal, and it's one of my favorite ideas. As Bob mentioned before, one of my passions in life <coughs> is comedy. It's a little bit of pressure. Whenever I talk, I'm always that's always mentioned, and I, I can never be that funny. I was once talking about uh, death and dying in Judaism, and I was introduced as New York's funniest <laughs> rabbi. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was challenging. Uh, this wasn't as challenging as this fight. Um, so I just want to end with a Pesach-related thought that relates to humor. Uh, Rav Sanchez Hirsch is the first one that I know of who points out that the first Jewish example of a joke, of wit, of humor, is when the Jews call out to Hashem and they say, Hamibli and Kvaran Bim Mitzrayim, Lakotan Lamut Bamidbar. They say, what? Where there were no graves in Egypt, he had to take us to the desert to die. You can almost hear at the end, what? There were no graves in Egypt, he had to take us to the desert to die. But I'm fine. Right? They were saying it like a line, and it's a very well crafted line. And if a person's a little bit um, scholarly or educated, we know that um, they weren't just being like, simple level of sarcasm. It was a very deep level of, of, of humor and satire they were saying, because what was Egypt known for? It could have been they were coming out of Poughkeepsie, and they would have said, what, well, there were no graves in Poughkeepsie? You had to take it to the desert? But specifically, Egypt was the world capital of graves, of tombs, of cemeteries, of death. That's what it was all about. So they're like, in case you didn't notice... Right? Maybe you didn't know it. Maybe you didn't think there were any graves in Egypt. You had to take us here to die. Um, here's newsflash. They knew how to bury people in Egypt. <laughs> it's kind of their specialty. So Rev Hirsch points out that that's the first example of humor in the Torah. And I just want to think about that for a moment. Many people, and I've heard Rabbi Shafter say this a long time ago. I met a few times with Rabbi Shafter about being a comedian and sort of like halakhas of comedy. And one of the things he quoted was this, this from Rav Hirsch. And he said when many people say that <coughs> what Rav Hirsch is saying is this is the way we knew from the very beginning would help us survive. Right? That having a sense of humor helps us survive. And it's what many people call gallows humor. And gallows humor is sometimes misunderstood. Some people think that gallows humor is when we, God forbid, point at the people on the gallows and we make jokes about it. It happens all the time in the news. Anytime there's a tragedy, people start making jokes about the tragedy. And I remember I once called a, a friend of mine on this, a very nice fellow. But I said, like, what are you making fun? You know, someone died. He said, gallows humor. That's not gallows humor. Gallows humor is when you are the one on the gallows. And you're so scared, you have to cope. And you make jokes. I remember many years ago, I asked why there were, were no records of, of jokes from the Holocaust. And I was told that it was very insensitive of me to even ask because that was beyond beyond the, the normal situation where people cope with humor. But since then, it's come out. There have been books, and it's come out that there were people coping even then by making jokes and, and doing gallows humor. I had one time in my life where I used gallows humor. I was in Ethiopia. I was supposed to be there for six weeks, and I was deported after two weeks. I remember meeting Shelley in, uh, what store was it in? You were buying pants from there. Huh? Where are you? Yeah, when I was getting all my canteen and everything. Yeah. And, um, and we, were, we were deported, and we were deported very suddenly. We were accused of... Um, of uh, proselytizing and uh, doing all kinds of stuff just because it's what we were doing. Um, <laughs> and um, and they, they were going to throw us out. And they took us to the airport and they took away our passports. It was very scary. We weren't sure, if God forbid, what was going to happen. 
and we complained. One of our complaints, one of our big complaints, were we didn't have a chance to buy tchotchkes, trinkets, gifts. Um, you know, how can you throw us out? We didn't have a chance. You know, every time you go to a country, you want the Coke bottle with Coca-Cola written in that language. So we complained. So they bought us each a Coke bottle. <laughs> and they, they had a fancy waiter with a towel on his arm and a white glove, and he brought us each the bottle. And when you, when you drink soda very quickly, you know what happens. So I was very nervous. I drank the bottle very quickly. And I let out a very big burst, and this waiter gave me a very dirty look. Like, this was our biggest problem at the moment. But he gave me this dirty look, and I turned to my friend, and I said, well, I guess this is not the country where it's a compliment. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that was my gallows humor. Um, Besides gallows humor, I think there's a whole other approach to why the Jews did what they did, and they used humor. I think a lot of times, um, I once asked Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, like, what's the proper place of humor in Judaism? And he gave a long answer. And part of what he said is that most of us are uncomfortable around someone that doesn't have a sense of humor. And it's just part of being human. And I think sometimes when we're stressed out, we lose our sense of humor, and people don't want to listen to someone that's totally stressed. And if you can inject a little humor, it humanizes what you're saying, and it helps you to be heard. So even though it was a little bit on the sarcastic side, this was what I call charming sarcasm, and the Jews, by using humor, they cause Moshe to hear them. If they would have just come to Moshe, if they would have said what I would have said, it wouldn't have worked. What I would have said was, oh my God, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. He would have said, settle down, go away, take a breath, see you later. But they said, what, there are no graves in Egypt? He was like, okay, I'm going to talk to God about this. And he did, and they were answered. And there's a place that I've worked for a bunch of years at on Pesach. One year, it was very cold at this place, and there was a, a very nice woman who was running things. And the morning after the first Seder, everybody was lining up. Her name was Doreen. One after the next, they were complaining, Doreen, you're freezing us to death. Doreen, they can't afford heat. Doreen, this is crazy. Doreen, it's ridiculous. Doreen, it's cold. Doreen, it's cold. Doreen, it's cold. And then one man named Irving Ginsberg came to Doreen, and he said, is it because when they went out of Egypt, it was very cold? that you made a coal so that we could recreate going out from Egypt. And he was the guy that she heard the most and said, okay, Irving, I'll take care of it. So I think that's the idea of why the Jews did it. One approach is gallows humor to deal with it, but the other approach is to be heard. When we use humor, we're human and we're heard. So that's just some thoughts on um, that. So I hope it was helpful to have some general thoughts on the Seder, to learn some Torah, and it should, it should be... And Aliyah for Eric and Shama. I'm very humbled and honored to have spoken on this occasion. Thank you. Yeah. Should we, should we do questions? We can well, do questions. One thing I want to mention, because you have actually touched on it, and I, I, I sort of have to mention it, that we are planning to have a speaker for the North American Conference on. Ethiopian Jewry. Oh, here. wow. And although it w- will not be charging admission, it'll be free, she will bring souvenirs. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is your chance. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. I don't know Coke bottles are among them. Okay. Here. I know one of the <laughs> things that they, that they have, they make these very nice tapestries. I did get one of those. I did get one of those. They make these beautiful tapestries that you can either put a pillow in or use like as a hollow yeah, cover. Yeah. yeah, people have seen them around. The other thing yeah. I wanted to mention in general, because Rabbi Hoffman had asked me, he, I know he had planned to be here tonight. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to be right. here on time, and obviously, right. um, you know, we're going to be commemorating in a few weeks the crossing of the Red Sea. It's nothing compared to crossing the <laughs> river this time of year. Right. Um, so, so he and, and Kitty, I know, had right. gone to, to Brooklyn right. today. Right. I, I assume they were. Right. He, he was very kind. He, he wrote the Bullman family, and he wrote me, explaining that he was going to make every effort to be here. But it was a long-standing commitment from before, and, yeah, it's understood that he's here in spirit. Um, yeah? What's your Hebrew name? You oh, <laughs> it's, I, I spell it before I say it. It's Nun Tet Ayan, Nata. That's my name. I didn't choose it. And since I was a kid, like, like, 
Yeah, people always correct me and they say that it's Netta, but it wasn't Netta. I was named after a a um, <coughs> an uncle of mine. He was Natta Zev, and people say to me, no, it's Nasa Natta. Yeah, there are people named Nasa Natta, but my uncle was Natta Zev. I'm Natta Zev. It's Kamatz Patach, Natta. That's, that's my name. It's unusual, and uh, I was called growing up, I was called Netta, Nuta, Nita, Nasan. When I get called up to the Torah, I say, they say, what's your name? I say, Nata, Nunter, Ayin, Kamat, Patach, Nata, 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 Yamod, Nasan. Yeah, so that's, that's my name story. Okay, if we could do the questions personally, too, I'm going to hang out here. Okay, thank you all for coming. Okay, come on. Oh, photo app. <laughs> yeah, I want a photo app on my phone too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's taped. Think. What did you tape it on? What is that? Uh, it's an app. Uh, I'm not really holding an app, but. I like that. It looks really high. It looks old tech, actually. <laughs> That's what looks so cool about it. That. Oh, right, right. Sorry, sorry.